And a mentor of mine was remarking about how, how come we are stuck, you know, with that image of our prosperity. Everyone that talks about agriculture almost immediately, as far as it's about agriculture in the past, we immediately get the picture of the groundnut pyramid. Uh, so this was in 2015 when my mentor saw this and he was talking to me about it. And I was telling him that actually I have been trying to talk about having an edifice, a monument that sort of gives us a new sense of belonging when it comes to agriculture, especially in northern Nigeria. And he asked me what it was. And I told him that I wanted to build a, an agricultural information house, if you like, like a data center, if you like which will not only connect farmers to uh, markets, but to new knowledge and to, um, you know, financial inclusion and, to, you know, the, the many things that they've been uh, kind of isolated from. And this was what gave birth to a project that I'm currently doing in Katsuna now called the Katsuna Sustainable Platform for Agriculture. It's basically a futuristic approach towards solving our agricultural problems that will also give us that sense of belonging that the Grand Pyramids gave us that we couldn't, uh, you know, leave them behind for so many years. Anyway, that's enough of my intro. Uh, uh, like she's made the introduction, I'm Nasya, I'm, I'm, I, I farm, uh, I'm also an entrepreneur, and uh, I think those two are probably the most, um, you know, repeated things in every introduction I gave because it's, it is about identity as it is about every other thing that I do and that most of us do. Um, throughout the course of this uh, talk or uh, parley, I would like if you had any questions, uh, I don't know how it is, is it through the moderator or would any of you just jump in? So I would, they would raise their hand and I will ask them to ask their question. I'll let you know. I don't know if you want to have an interval in the middle where we all ask questions or you want to have a continuous screen where we're um, answering or asking your questions. I think the more interactive it is, maybe in the intervals of 10 minutes. So I don't know, because that okay. tends to talk a bit too much. Okay, um, I'll keep an eye then on the... Uh, messaging chat if you have any questions please feel free to add, to ask and put your hand up and then i'll let you i'll unmute perfect fantastic okay um just one second okay so uh i just muted my phone as well so i know You so you you know you unmute all of us. So I think it's okay, just that we can't hear anyone talking. Mm. Everyone's quiet. Okay. I think it's around your network. Most likely. I I think the um screen the nursery is frozen. For me too. Okay. No, just Nasser. Yeah, Nasser's uh, thing is frozen at the moment, so bear with us. Maybe he just needs to refresh his page. Um, for now, just hold on and stay muted. It's from him. So please, let's wait and see how he go. Thank you. Yeah, I think with my internet. Am I on now? Yes, you're back with us. Perfect. That was my internet, apologies. Okay. Okay, so I was, I was telling you how uh, we're fond of reproductive, you know, uh, problem solving when it comes to agriculture. We want to do things the way they've always been done. And no matter how much we want to entrepreneur our way out of agriculture, it's essentially a public thing. It is, you know, essentially a public sector industry everyone from the government to the private sector has to be involved so it's just wishful thinking to say that we can't we have to you know uh, the private sector should lead i believe that in agriculture 
it has to and will always remain public, at least for the foreseeable future. So uh, I tend to talk about government a lot when I talk about agriculture because it is basically the bane of the whole agricultural debacle we have, not only in Nigeria, but in most parts of the developing world, if you like. Um, an interesting thing to note is Nigeria always tries to do intensification, right? We try to say, okay, if there's, if we want agricultural productivity, we need to have more fertilizer, we need to have more seeds, we need to have, you know, more farmers farming, right? And you couldn't fault that, right? Because it has worked for some time. The Green Revolution worked in a way that, uh, you know, was unprecedented for global agriculture because it intensified input it intensified farming. However, it was a specific kind of farming. There was a huge investment in science and technology regarding genetics, engineering in terms of seeds, and many other things that led to the Green Revolution. And the world was saved from literally, you know, exterminating itself out of hunger. However, in Nigeria, we just want to buy more fertilizer. And that hurts because uh, Farming and agriculture is beyond just a particular type of input. First of all, it should be market-based. Second of all, it should be precise, both in terms of, you know, the science of farming, but also in terms of, you know, the growing for a specific market. And these are principles that work whether you're in agronomy or in livestock, animal husbandry, or in poultry or in you know, agroforestry, whatever you do, the principles are the same. So I find it hard as an entrepreneur uh, in Nigeria to kind of communicate this because once you start talking to either farmers or the government or the banks, they're all about, are you bringing in fertilizers? Now, of course, I'm generalizing, but this is it. They want to hear about intensification when you're talking about precision. Imagine talking to a farmer in, let's say, a remote uh, local government in, let's say, in, in, in a remote part of Bakuri local government in Katsina. They're growing, let's say, sorghum, and then you're telling them that they have to, you know, wait for the right time to plant. And you're telling them that they can't replant what they planted last year. Now they have to wait for this seed. They not only have to wait for it, they have to pay for it. I mean, farmers are conservative, right? They kind of are attuned to the hard things in life. They want to touch it and feel it, you know? Soil, rain, termite, hoe. These are the things that they've been used to all their lives. And all of a sudden you come to them and you're telling them they have to do these new things that are entirely unheard of. So it's kind of tough. And you can see why I say the entrepreneur can never do it alone. In some cases, um, you can only fail actually. However, we know how much fuel failure is for the entrepreneur. And uh, it's interesting that a lot of us understand that we have to look back to be able to see the future. And I believe that this is uh, a great deal of what I have been trying to do for the past couple of years, which means uh, I'm able to talk to everyone here. I don't know how much agricultural background everybody has here. Uh, like I said, I haven't gone through any bios of everybody here, so maybe this is going to be one of our first breaks to have the uh, questions. Great. Yeah. Okay, so are there any questions on the floor from anyone? Just raise your hand on the chat. Well, it looks like everyone is just attentively listening for now. Uh, I think okay. <laughs> it's oh, a mature okay. for Christians, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's go. Let's carry on. Then. Oh, we have one question from Lowell uh, Muhammad. So Lowell, when I um, open the platform for you, please uh, state your name and where you're from. Lowell, you're unmuted. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I think um, my image is quite dark, right? Yes, a little bit. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, that's the dark mode version of Muhammad Law. <laughs> so you guys should deal with it. Okay, fine. So um, first, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Law. 
-hmm. right? And I think I'm quite familiar with uh, a couple of people already uh, in the group, a, a few new faces um, today. And uh, particularly, I think I invited um, Faisal Bukhar. He's here, I believe, with us. Okay, fine. Faisal is here. And okay, so uh, I want to talk um, to Nasru. Uh, mm -hmm. First, he owes me a huge apology. Um, it's sad I have to call you out in public. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, so he's supposed to call me. I've been in self isolation, or I was in self self isolation. No, I got you through the phone. Yeah. So okay, fine. Okay. So so back to the topic of agri. Anyway, and how we could use that um, to change a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that have been really going on in the um, agri space now is the creation of technology platforms really to drive agriculture. And recently, or just about uh, a week ago, IFAD actually launched a $40 million grant program for development of agri platform. And I think they are working to build that up to about $200 million. And probably all of that will be invested um, in Nigeria. Right now, um, I am not too concerned about the platforms themselves because um, I and Nasser have spoken about these things extensively um, in the past. But how much can this technology actually change how we do agri in Nigeria, especially if you take the situation of the rural farmer? Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, take it as as, as a case study. Because we know the larger percentage of our farmers are actually peasant, rural, smallholder farmers. So, Nasur, I, I, I would love you to really touch on that topic and how much technology can actually, you know, help the very poor of the poor farmers in rural areas. Fantastic. If our moderator allows me, I can pick it up from there. Yep. Go ahead, Nasur. Okay, so, uh, well, if there wasn't any question, uh, thankfully this was what I was going to talk about next, but luckily okay. we have a seance. <laughs> okay, so, okay, if you're going to talk about it, then we have two more hands up at the moment. So, do you want to listen to what they have to say first, and then we can go on to speak? Um, sure, let's do that. So, uh, next we have Umar Shihu, who has a question. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk at this time. I, this is the first time I joined the session, and my name is Umar Shay Umar, a student of agriculture, environment, and food economics in the University of Brighton, United Kingdom. I'm currently doing my research in contract farming and the issue of social capital, you know, and so on and so forth. So I understand that, uh, you know, Smallholder farmers are quite unpredictable, very much conservative, unreliable, you know. And whenever you talk of technology, you have a lot of issues because I'm now trying to even understand, you know, the issue of contract enforcement because of the issue of, you know, transaction is quite low. You can impose contract and sometimes you can use law because sometimes the amount of money it will cost you to even take a farmer to a court. It's even better if you can allow the farmer to go scot free. So, my question is sometimes, you know, in, in terms of communicating technology to smallholder farmers, you will have a lot of problem because you you introduce technology to farmers, they don't want to follow the technology, they understand they prefer to use a kind of local technology they use in, you know, addressing the issue of modern technology available to them. That definitely affects the efficiency of a lot of things in the farming industry. So we need to have a kind of, you know, advice or maybe an overview of addressing such issues because we are working on so many technology to see how to address issue of contract disagreement, breach of trust, this and that, and, you know, things like that, something like that, yeah. Just to take a shot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Got it. 
Fantastic. Great one. Uh, let's hear the next one before we answer, right? Right. Um, we have a lot of hands going up. I suppose we'll get, we'll start. Okay, so maybe we right? take these. Right. One last one and then we proceed forward so we can let you speak. Okay. Oh, that works. Okay. So there's Aisha Yakubu Bako. I muted her. Aisha, you're okay. unmuted. Again, um, this is Aisha Yakubu Bako. I'm the investment lead for Lynx DFID. And I got the uh, hi Fatima. Can you hear me? Fatima, hello. Yep, hi. May I suggest something, please? Uh, I think if we can continue asking people to ask questions, I think we. Go oh God, I just made. There's an interruption. Really quickly, let me wrap up really quickly. Nasser, what I want to find out from you, the program I'm in is actually planning to look at supporting young people like you in doing so. I'm planning a tech outreach to see how we can support companies to bring in technology into the agri-space sector. And I would be interested in hearing your thoughts, all of you, on what you're doing now, how these uh, processes can be leveraged and how DFID can support you. Perfect. So we'll stop with those questions and proceed. Thank you. Thank you. It seems we have a tech issue, do we? Hello, Fatima. Fatima. No, I'm lower. Oh, sorry. So um, I, I think we are good. Um, maybe you should allow Nasser to come in. Uh, Nasser. He, uh, yes, I, he's unmuted at the moment, I believe. Yeah, apparently um, he can't hear uh, what everyone is saying. Um, I didn't change his, uh, I didn't change his, Ability to speak or mute him. Isn't that a problem? Maybe it's just Internet a tech issue. Yeah, maybe it's just a tech issue. We'll hold on for now, please. Thank you. Fatima, can I say something, please? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to see uh, Aisha Bako for bringing this to young farmers like so many others are here so that they can support and give us money to go and farm. Because I don't know how to farm. It's only my French from Sudinda has found. I'm surprised to see Aisha Bako supporting farmers with this time around. I know she is a serial entrepreneur with gyms. Is it gyms? I don't know. Something like that. UN stuff. So I'm happy to see her, and I know they will support. They do things right in Kaduna State. Perfect. Thank you. We're, we're so happy to have you all on here. So I think our main speaker um, is having uh, maybe a tech issue at the moment. So hopefully he'll be on shortly. Was that me again? Because my internet was fine this time around. I'm yeah. going to Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, too bad for that, sorry. Um, oh yeah, so I was saying uh, the whole essence of talking about leveraging on technology, um, I mean, I think it's about how really the tech can change the way things are done. And a lot of the times you realize that it's not really about the tech. Um, having worked with some of the most advanced technologies in terms of remote sensing, in terms of, uh, you know, digital technologies, even outside of Nigeria before starting my company, I have realized that sometimes it's really all in the detail. I mean, you can have a tractor that can talk to, you know, a warehouse that can talk to, you know, the chemical provider that can talk to even the plant. However, if you don't have it on ground or if you don't have somebody to operate it, 
or if you don't have the connectivity in terms of broadband or whatever network the tractor is using to talk to all of these things, it's really not going to work. And let's assume you have it. You have a tractor that can, you know, be connected to the internet, you know, internet of things, and you have lo local Nigerian farmers that can use that tractor and they can afford it. If what they are producing is not of any worth to the market, you're really back at just having a cool tractor. So the very first thing that needs to be done is to get that market fit to try to say, okay, we have figured out, you know, a place that needs a certain kind of maize or rice. Yeah. And it's willing to pay. And we can even, you know, have a contractual agreement or, you know, the market really talks to the supply side. Then you can start talking about technologies and then technologies can be useful for you. I mean, I'm not saying discard everything you have until you get this market fit. However, it's really essential to have markets at the heart of what you do before you talk about technology. No matter how complex or how, you know, difficult your technology seems or how advanced or how AI enabled or how, you know, whatever the trend that is going on, if there's no market involved, it's not going to work. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we were at MIT, the professor just came out and he showed us an elaborate plan of one of his Indian students that had about 60 to 70 patents to his name in the US. And he's done these amazing machines. And this guy came to the professor and was telling him that, look, uh, I probably will be the next, you know, he calls a billionaire's name. And the professor said, all right. And he asked for advice so the professor told him they need to take a walk and they walked around there's a, the daughter of a professor was selling lemonade just around the corner and it's really easy all she does she's an agri entrepreneur a little girl of eight all she does is get the lemonade you know uh, get the lemons you know turn it into lemonade and there's lines of people because it was a boston summer and a lot of people were just you know buying and drinking the the lemonade and he told him that's what you need to learn a paying customer that's what you need to learn, a market. No matter how complex your tech is, if the market is not there, it's useless. So now we have, you know, uh, technologies, leveraging on technology. A lot, a lot of people, including me, have been talking about technology in terms of the computer, in terms of, you know, things that, you know, are termed as technology in this startup age. However, fertilizers. Animal husbandry, like I said, genetic engineering, you know, seeds, all of these things are avenues for technology. I wonder how a lot of people in Nigeria are not thinking about them. And actually, to jump into the second question without really going into it, contract enforcement, breach of trust, all of those things are things that can be innovated upon as well. There's a brand new kind of science or technology, if you like, that's springing up all over the world in terms of business model engineering. A lot of people are sitting down and having no transportation uh, labels and still being the biggest transportation companies in the world, like Uber. It's just the idea of hacking the business model, right? I see no reason why we can't do that in agriculture. And until we start thinking around that, thinking around, you know, technologies being beyond just a mobile app, beyond just, you know, uh, satellites and digital, we won't really get far. We have to start thinking like that. And once we start thinking like that, then we need to really bring the technology down. Um, uh, Mohammed would agree with me, having uh, seen a bunch of startups that are, you know, uh, employing digital platforms in Nigeria that Sometimes it's the simple things that matter. A lot of farmers really don't care that you have a sick dashboard. All they want is where's the money gonna come from? Where's the seeds? Where are the fertilizers? Like the hard things, right? Now, once you're able to answer these questions, then you can take it a step higher, right? Can you now make the input precise? The money that they need, input that they need, can we kind of so the question really should be, how do we deliver precision agriculture or precision farming to smallholder farmers? And this precision farming does not only have to work with the most precise of, you know, geographic information, but also business models, like I've mentioned. So how can we develop a system whereby a farmer cannot break a contract? 
the World Bank, and I think Aisha, uh, Aisha Baku here, uh, who's one of the VIPs in the room today, would agree with me that uh, uh, DFID, the World Bank, most of these institutions have been in Nigeria for a while, and the work they are doing is monumental. And I really, really am happy that you know they're doing what they're doing because some of us entrepreneurs wouldn't have had any chances without them. Uh, one of the projects that I nearly uh, participated in was an index insurance system that the World Bank was trying to build. I think it was a yield-based index insurance system. So what happens on an index insurance system, I'm sure some of you or most of us here know, uh, is you kind of benchmark against either yield or weather uh, to pay out insurance to farmers. Now imagine a system whereby I don't have to go to the farm to see if the farmer made any losses or made any um, uh, gains. I can sit down and an intelligent system will be able to tell me based on the ground realities of the farm. This is so easy, it cut costs, like the insurance company doesn't have to go out to do anything other than just register the farmer. And it's actually working. In Tanzania and Kenya, they have something called Kilimo Salama. In Swahili, I think it means uh, farming in peace or something. Kilimo Salama is an index insurance system Thank you. Um, I don't know if it was for me personally, but uh, Nasser, I think you cut off for a little bit after you were speaking about the insurance, index insurance. He was about saying something on Tanzania. I think there's there's a heavy load on my internet because it keeps tripping. Are you with me now? You're back, thank you. Sorry, you cut off there briefly. Um, oh, you must forgive my internet. No. Where was it? Um, you were talking about index insurance, um, a Kalima Salama. Uh, oh yeah, so yeah, so Kalima Salama worked in, in, in Kenya. And in terms of agricultural prosperity, I, I tell you, the Kara Ua zone in Katsina, where I come from, is worth more than probably Kenya and Tanzania combined if you remove flowers from their agricultural productivity. In terms of food, we're better than the two countries combined. That's just a subsection of a subsection of one state in one region of Nigeria. So imagine that kind of thing. So I think the question about leveraging technology is it's a no-brainer. We have to, we must, right? It's, it's our only way out. The question now is, you know, what techniques, what ways, you know, what methodology do we use in terms of not only educating our entrepreneurs on the beachheads to attack rather than just trying to, you know, drop an AI-enabled tractor that is, you know, using virtual reality. To, like, no, I don't want to hear those kind of things. And now I know that I'm sounding as conservative of some of, as some of the farmers, but hey, I am one of them. And I come from one of them. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really not their fault when they are conservative like that. It's just that there are some realities that we have to pay attention to. Now, um, uh, to, to, to talk about the last, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Haji Aisha said a few things about links. And luckily, um, uh, I was in touch with Andrew, I think Andrew Gutside, who uh, I think is, I don't know, somehow, the head of links or something at the start of it or something. And uh, they brought most of the agri-tech startups in Nigeria, in in Abuja, I think at the time uh, the UK, the then UK Prime Minister Theresa May came to Nigeria. And, uh, you know, we were filled in on links that it's coming and this is what it's going to do. I think the one takeaway that we have here is the stakeholder approach. Like today, there are people from academics, I'm from enterprise, and I'm sure there's a lot of people from other sectors in this call alone. I think Lynx has to leverage that power of 
the agricultural value chain, the stakeholders, get the universities, get the risk capital, get the entrepreneurs, get the government, get everybody and try to kind of form, uh, you know, a journey that is together, right? Like get to hear from every side of uh, the value chain, especially the farmer side, and then the entrepreneur side, and then the government side. Because these two that I've mentioned, the farmer and the entrepreneur, no matter how big you are as an entrepreneur, you're fragile. You're up there with the farmer. You know, we're looking for capital, we're looking for ways to make life easier. Same as the farmer. However, the government should be at the bottom, carrying everybody, and we cannot do without the government. And another important institution that everybody seems to forget is the traditional institution, uh, like the, 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 the leaders, the traditional leaders. Um, I don't know, if, most of us here know Babanguna, and I think uh, Kola and his team at Babanguna have done a remarkable thing in terms of these, uh, you know, stakeholder integration that I'm talking about. You know, they've been able to kind of innovate on the business model side of things and use technology only as an enabler. So uh, if you talk about Babanguna, you can't say it's, it's an app or it's a, um, you know, it's a platform. You know, their, their core is, you know, at the business development level, you know, they are helping farmers grow and linking them to markets. And once you do that, amazing things happen. Nobody's going to ask you what technology or what app you use to talk to your farmer. But yes, people will eat that rice or that maize or, you know, use that cotton to make clothes. And this happens every time in all the value chains of the agricultural uh, industry, if you like. Um, I don't know if I've answered all the three questions. Okay, so I just touched on the contract enforcement and breach of trust um, uh, question a little bit. But I think, Omar, uh, you're doing a phenomenal thing. I hope to see more people researching this kind of thing at that kind of level. Because at the end of it, we can't do things offhand. We can't, you know, rely on our instincts in agriculture. It has to be methodic, just like it takes a medical doctor or an engineer or, you know, a lawyer all these years to graduate. I think the people that decide for agriculture should go through that kind of rigorous training and should have that kind of level of thinking because the farmer would not necessarily be able to do that. Oh, I think I'm out again, right? No, we can hear you. You're just the video on yeah, but you can't see me because my power just went out, but the oh. generator is going to come. Uh, and and uh, this is another interesting thing. This is what happens to Nigerian entrepreneurs day in, day out, right? Mm -hmm. You're out of power. <laughs> you're out of uh, internet. You're, and despite all this, you know, uh, the, again, to quote one of my professors, he says, this is, uh, entrepreneurs have to be anti-fragile. And I think antifragile is actually a word that uh, uh, alludes to the entrepreneur's ability to thrive despite all the pressures in the world. So you have COVID-19 out there. Business so, has so, to. Yeah. Umar Shiro has a pressing question on, on exactly what you're talking about right now. So I'll unmute him to give okay. him the opportunity. All right, then. Perfect. Okay. Let's hear. Umar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. This is quite interesting. You know, I, I have a lot of concern on this issue of smallholder powers in northern Nigeria because it's, the issue is so overwhelming to the extent that no matter what you do, you just have to do what you can and leave the rest. Yeah. I, I begin to think, you know, trying to, you know, contextualize the issue of technology leveraging because um, I know that there is going to be a trade up between the technology and the labor forces, you know, employ in the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. So I I don't know if the technology, you know, we're referring to something that would be useful to the farmers or something that would be useful to the entrepreneur as a person. And on top of this, I just try to talk about, you know, the succession of the Nigerian agricultural policy from the ATA to FEC to, to liberalization of 
the output market, the input market, and so on and so forth. You know, what I realized with these smallholder farmers is that you give them everything, and even if the price is fair, they have the potential to break your agreement, which means their decision could either make or break an entrepreneur. So, do you think? Do you think with the current situation we have in northern Nigeria, where farmers are completely irrational, they care about short-term profit, then the long-term relationship in the business or whatever, then how do you think technology will come in to bridge this uncertainty that we pay in their, in their you know, out maybe in the supply markets, I may say. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, I'll just write that down and we'll take the next. Right. No other questions? Should I go on? There are actually a whole lot of questions at the moment. So I don't know if it would be overwhelming to be taking a break in the middle of each um, segment to answer all of them. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about this? Uh, I can quickly just uh, round up and then we can have the remainder of the session could just be interactive, be, right? Yeah, that would be great because then it kind of stops the um, interruptions and back and forth. Thank okay, you. okay, yeah. So, like I said, um, uh, I didn't want to make this about all the cool technologies that are out there uh, because I could just write an article about that or I could just make a list and send it to you and you send it to everybody, right? I wanted to kind of approach this with the kind of intellectual rigor that will enable us to go and think about things and to kind of help in, you know, shaping the conversation uh, as either people in the academia or people in business or people in government. You never know, maybe some of us are in government, maybe some of us will be in government, or maybe some of us have the ears of people in government. So here's something, I read a book um, called Food and the Agricultural Revolution. Uh, Food and the African Revolution, sorry, Food and the African Revolution. It was written by Professor Okello Uchuli, uh, uh, an ABU professor back in the day. And uh, he went into details about how agriculture started right from, you know, the 1900s up to uh, independence and up to, you know, the 1980s and, and early 90s. And it's amazing what you get to discover. 80% of us would say agriculture declined because we discovered oil. However, that was not the case. There were a series of things that were happening right from the 1920s up to the 1970s that were ensuring that our agricultural future was handicapped. Things from colonization, things from substitution of you know, our productivity in uh, favor of cash, you know, cash crops and things that have to do with the way, you know, our beef and dairy products are produced in terms of, uh, you know, even the case that we are facing today uh, with uh, the farmer herder crisis. And this is what Professor Okilo Uchuli said, that until we're able to kind of come out of that blow that was dealt to us by, you know, uh, colonization and all of those things that happened, we cannot continuously blame oil because it was going to happen whether we had uh, oil exploration or not. And interestingly, now a lot of people are beginning to see that because we exported groundnut. Our groundnut was you know, of the greatest quality and guess what? it was used for in Britain. Most of it was used as animal feed. Meanwhile, the cattle in Madagali, for instance, has to go all the way to the south of Nigeria to be able to get food and water. However, in Kano, groundnut is produced at such, you know, incredible levels. So, there needed to be an investment in animal feed production in Nigeria to be able to sustain that industry, that industry, the industry, the dairy. 
I mean, now in Nigeria, in Kaduna, in Niger, and in Plateau, and in Mambila, you know, there are some outstanding enterprises that deal with cattle and dairy and, you know, the whole lot. However, it's barely enough. The protein need of two states alone cannot be provided by all of those companies. I've been fortunate among, uh, I think even uh, Dr. Lord, who's here, has also worked with uh, uh, a few of these companies, and we know the pain. So when I read, hello, are you with me? Yes, we're still yes, with you. Still with when I read uh, uh, Professor Okelo Uchuli and I see what's happening, and you know, it just dawns on me that we need to leverage technology now to be able to leapfrog because it's no longer about catching up. We need to catch up and we need to win the race if we are to survive because of our exploding population, because of you know the current state of oil itself. Um, and secondly, uh, I was also talking to a mentor of mine recently and uh, we were going on about the marketing board, the marketing board of oil. Uh, and this will go into Umar's um, question about, you know, pricing, about uncertainty, about risk, about farmers, about how they leave the entrepreneur in the middle of it, about how the middleman leaves the farmer in the middle of it in some cases. And how when you're big, when you're like Angote, everything has to go in your, in your favor because the way the market is formulated, because the way the smallholder farmer is completely isolated. And of course, because we're in Nigeria. So he was telling me that Nigeria was at one point responsible for about, I think, 15% of all the cotton production in the world. And guess what? To talk about Karatwa again, that region I come from, especially my uh, you know hometown, Malunfashi uh, and surrounding environs, we were responsible for at least nine, I mean, 11% of the cotton output of Nigeria. That Karatwa region, our cotton was so good that it was probably about 7% of all the cotton that was consumed in the world. I mean, that was taken up by the factories and all of that. So it's interesting to look at history once, ag once again, you know, and to see that we are not even below where we were in the 60s and 70s and even 80s. We are far from there. We are completely bereft of what we had. And to be able to get back, we really need to hack the process. We really need to be innovative enough, not only in leveraging technology, but approaching it with some discipline. Imagine the most simplistic way of leveraging technology. I'll give you an example. We have about 6,000 maize farmers on my platform at Burden. And to improve their productivity, one of the simplest things we did was just send them a text message about plant spacing and about increasing plant population. So if you had one hectare, and you could increase the plant population of that one hectare, it simply meant you had more output per that hectare. And it's as simple as that. And our policymakers do not think like that. And this is why I'm saying that we basically need to go back to basics, look at our history, but also look at the simple things that we could employ from modern technology and modern, um, yeah, uh, answers uh, Umar's question. You just oh, came yeah. yes. You nodded, right? <laughs> okay. So going on, I think um, Nigeria, like I've said, must leverage on technology. It's a necessity. It's a responsibility. It's a duty. If you have the ear of any policy maker, it's not enough to blindly get fertilizer alone. Like this government, the, the current administration, whatever, in 2015 came with so much buzz about, you know, agriculture. We're going to diversify the economy. We're going to leverage on agriculture. And everybody bought it. I bought it. I mean, they did some amazing things. 
And the agricultural promotion policy of the federal government is one of the most outstanding policy documents I've seen on agriculture. However, if the first thing you have to do is set up a presidential fertilizer initiative that's directly linked to the sovereign wealth fund, then you know there are issues around you, right? And secondly, all of a sudden, all the warehouses, the silos that were owned by the federal government were being owned by one Ali Nangoti. I mean, it's not Nangoti, I'm just using it as a term. It's owned by one big entrepreneur that would probably do better without it. You can see that someone is trying to monopolize, someone is trying to, you know, hold. Meanwhile, innovation, agriculture, justice, all of these things are not a one-man game. No matter how pious you are or how noble you are, if you're going to be in charge of what everybody does, then, and you're human, then there are bound to be problems. So innovation is an open game. Everybody has to be involved. Agriculture is an open game. Everybody has to be involved. So you can't tell me that, you know, one person is going to take care of all the fertilizer in Nigeria. Or one person is going to take care of all the silos or, or the warehousing. I mean, now we have a case, we have a pandemic. And there needs to be food distributed, right, to, to all the people as palliatives, all the people that cannot get it. Did you know that the food that was supposed to be distributed to people based on the 2018 floods have still not reached all of the families that are supposed to get them? Now you are talking about getting food from those same silos that are supposed to satisfy a need in 2018. Two years gap. And we are going to play catch up with death that, you know, we need to have started yesterday. So evidently, without technology, we cannot do it. We need everything in the game. We need data. I think I'm muted, but I'm back on. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so we need all of these things in place, but we also need to go together and we need it in a systemic form. If I'm doing it correctly, it's, I'm just going to be a little drop in the ocean. Because if you take the statistic of us having 15 million farmers active, um, if I have 10,000 farmers, it really means nothing. So we need everybody in the game. I don't think there's going to be competition in terms of agricultural innovation in Nigeria in the next 50 years. So maybe in a century from now, we might have viable competition. However, now everybody can come and grab the biggest chunk of the market and there'll still be room for everybody else. And yeah, I'll, I'll end it here. Leveraging technology is a necessity. However, saying that this is the specific technology we should go for is dangerous. We need to be able to analyze and go with what goes for every value chain, every geographical location. Luckily, we're all in the tropics. We're all in the same you know, country and part of the world, and we don't have different time zones in Nigeria. And that's really helpful because it means that one solution can go for many. It starts with data, I believe, and that's why the first thing I did was uh, you know, build my company around agricultural data. It's tough. We're still in that valley of death whereby we're dealing with an unprofitable business model because farmers are not able to pay for what you know we're offering, but we're continuously hacking and we're trying to do it. And really, I believe in the cooperation of everybody in the agricultural value chain to make it happen. Uh, going forward, I will appreciate um, specific questions uh, about areas that I haven't uh, touched because I really don't want to fall for the trap of talking to you about things you already know. I have a feeling that everybody here is kind of a lecturer on their own. So, <laughs> yeah, um, that's me. Thank you so much. Thank you, for that, that was very informative. So we have quite a few hands up. So um, we'll start with Jakub S. Wooden. I think he has a question for you. So I, I've unmuted you. Yeah, hope so just a brief introduction on yourself and the question. All right. Thank you very much, uh, the moderator, for giving me the opportunity. And also thank you, the presenter, for this uh, insightful uh, 
talk. My name is uh, Yaqub Sani Udil. I'm a PhD student here at the King Fahad University of Petroleum in Saudi Arabia. I'm studying uh, physics and uh, my area of research is uh, renewable energy. And uh, I could see from the CV of the presenter is also expert in renewable energy. So I want to take you a little to renewable energy field. As we know, energy and uh, agriculture are fundamentally the major concerns of uh, Nigeria. So what do you think we can do differently to employ renewable energy as a means uh, of energy generation? Maybe we could solve our lingering energy problem in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Are we going to take more or should I just? What we'll do is we'll answer and then we'll go to the next question. Okay, fantastic. Um, uh, I'm really delighted to have you here, um, Yakub, and I'm hoping that after this we would have contact of everybody, right? Yes, inshallah, uh, we'll do all of that. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, Renewable energy is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, I mean, uh, you are on a PhD on it, which is incredible. Like I said about Umar, I think we need to have more people doing these kind of novel sciences out there, right? Uh, because really our ICAP is important. No matter, so this is what happens with innovation. Uh, I'll give you a little formula that innovation equals invention multiplied by commercialization. So no matter how much inventors you have or how much inventions you have, if you're not uh, multiplying it with the right type of selling in terms of the invention, it's going to be zero, right? Innovation will be zero. Likewise, no matter how many salespeople or entrepreneurs you have, if there's no invention, innovation is going to be zero, right? So in agriculture, it's the same. And in renewable energies, it's the same. We need to have the innovation capacity. We need to have people. We need to have a higher level of PhD per capita, not only in northern Nigeria, but in the entire sub-Saharan region of Africa. Um, to get to your uh, exact question, employing renewable energy is tough. Uh, we've recently set up a factory in uh, Kaduna, uh, mill and rice, uh, you know, corn flour, and also producing high quality planting material. And it hurts me that the factory is not off grid and the factory is actually going to be using fossil fuels most of the time because we will have generators to run on definitely if uh, the main grid fails. However, the center I'm building in Katsina is going to be completely off grid because I believe that uh, we need to make a point with the abundant uh, resource we have in terms of renewable energy. If you're in Katana, or any part of the North actually, wind energy is available to you, the sun is abundant, and even biofuels are something that we can talk about when you're talking about really complementing. Um, however, there are a lot of arguments and debates around uh, do we really stop producing food and start producing fuel? Um, and uh, I'm really for food when it comes to that, but I'm also for complementation. Um, the problem now is I think there's a great barrier in renewable energy in terms of pricing and in terms of availability of technology. You don't have access to effective, in terms of technology and in terms of cost, solar solutions, wind power solution, and even biofuel solutions in northern Nigeria or in Nigeria. I know there are a few companies like uh, Blue Camel, like even Total, uh, that are out there with amazing solutions. But really, when you talk to small and medium enterprises and you, know, you expect them to jump on that bandwagon, it really doesn't make sense for them economically. So I think there, there's, a, there's huge potential and we must really think like that. We need to have 50, Yakubu's PhDs in renewable energies 10 years ago. 
in one state. That's how big the problem is. And when we have those, we need to have 50 entrepreneurs, you know, at a scale, like not small entrepreneurs, 50 innovation driven entrepreneurs with probably multi billion naira companies in northern Nigeria doing this thing, employing the best brains, coming up with the best solutions, doing these things. Sadly, we're not there. So all we can do now is, like the topic of this talk, leverage. I think we can do it, uh, and, and uh, we are, we're on the road to do it. If everybody here talks to the policy people, talks to the business people, or talks to themselves if they are in the shoes of these people I've mentioned. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Imagine a Nigeria like that brimming with entrepreneurs and people with PhD. I can't wait till we reach that stage. Okay, so we have a question. Um, Shamsuddin um, Emama, uh, take the floor, please. Yep, Shamsuddin, you've unmuted yourself, but we can't hear you. Okay, so it seems uh, we can't hear you at the moment, so we'll move to the next question. I suppose it seems like we'll probably be wrapping up around 20 past. So, Rabi U Abdusamad? The floor is Abdus yours. Salam. Sorry, Abdus Salam, I couldn't see the last name. Thanks. All right. All right. Um... I am Rabi Abdus Salam Magadji of the Department of Human Physiology. Uh, Faculty of Basic Medical Sciences, College of Health Sciences, Amaribela University area. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy to be uh, in the midst of these, you know, super guys. Uh, but on the other hand, um, well, I came, I came in late, but I think I got the uh, grip of um, what you people were talking about. Yep. Hello. We'll hold on for five seconds. Uh, oh, we're situated the people. Hello. Yes, yeah. you're back. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. What I'm saying is that um, my problem with technology is that we normally have is the fact that how do we normally scale it down for our local people? Because we know when we're talking of agriculture, more than 90% of the uh, people in agriculture are peasant farmers. So how do we scale it down to make it our own, to make it what, or maybe a kind of something that they can buy in? It's just like the way, for instance, now I'm, I'm in medical sector. I have now seen, for instance, the issue of COVID-19 that we're talking about now. The issue of social distancing, I have been lecturing online for some other people, telling people that whatever technology we bring, we need to make it our own. If you're talking of now lockdown at home, that is one of the main problems that we are having because people, that stay in houses that um, uh, face me, I face you, as we, as we normally call it. They are more crowded now in their houses. They don't have good hygiene. They use one toilet. They use So it's another form of making them to even kind of uh, have some other problems. Mm -hmm. Well, if you go abroad, you know that, of course, you know, uh, a house, you know, somebody can afford to stay, you know, have maybe has about three, four rooms, and maybe the family is just about two, or maybe consists of two, three people. So what I'm saying, whatever technology you bring in, how, how are you working towards making it something that will not be bought by people in our own country? Got it. Thank you so much for that question. Um, uh, I'll share a talk um, or a panel that I attended in Helsinki a year ago, two years ago, actually, at Slush. Um, and uh, for you to just know that this is not... A, a Nigeria only problem. And I think attitudinal change is one of the biggest mountains that we have to, you know, scale as a country when it comes to people um, uh, in terms of, you know, accepting technologies, in terms of doing the right thing, in terms of, you know, corruption, all of that in Nigeria. Um, however, I'm happy to tell you that the level of um, proliferation of technologies, especially mobile in Nigeria, is outstanding. And if something as complex as a mobile phone can be 
uh, accepted and can penetrate to even the remotest part of a country like Nigeria, then trust me, um, you know, advanced seeds should be able to penetrate even faster. Also, uh, you know, advances in, uh, you know, fisheries, aquaculture should be able to penetrate even faster. Animal husbandry advances should be even penetrating faster. So really the question is that of, I think, public sector leadership. You know how I gave you that analogy of the entrepreneur and the farmer being on top and the government and the, and the risk capital, that's the banks and the investors being at the bottom supporting them. We have no bottom, that's the truth. We need systemic change. No matter how much you know, technology I bring or how good it is, if we don't have the you know, public avenues, the systems for it to ride on, it's not going to work. It can work for a few people, it can work in silos, it's never going to be as systemic if there are no platforms or systems for it to ride. So I don't think we have an issue with watering down technology for uh, people to use. And this is why I say, sometimes our approach towards the technology is wrong. Everybody is thinking, you know, AI, apps, you know, all of those things. We need to kind of remove that idea of, you know, technology being this high-tech advanced thing that we can't use. We've been employing it for generations. We just need to up our game and to be able to innovate correctly. Remember, Innovation is not complete if there's only invention. If you go to the agricultural or the engineering department of your university, sir, ABU's area, you have a lot of projects since the 1970s, I think, that are sitting on shelves. Amazing things that have been developed by students that have passed out there with flying colors that can compete anywhere in the world. But that's how far they've gone. Shelves in ABU's area. Nobody is using them, nobody is commercializing them. Innovation is not complete if you don't have commercialization and invention together. All we're doing in our universities is invent, invent, and nobody's commercializing. And in some cases, all we're doing is commercialize, commercialize, and nobody's inventing. So you have somebody in the Midlands in the United Kingdom or in Texas in the United States that comes up with a precision farming app, and you're saying that your people can't use it. It was never meant for your people. It was never meant for us. What we need to do is to have indigenous innovation or at least indigenous hacking. So we can take that Texan, you know, precision farming app, reverse engineer the hell out of it and make it work for our people. And there are a lot of companies doing that currently on ground. Um, yeah, so in a nutshell, I think we need to go back to the drawing board in terms of systems and systemic approach to technology. Don't worry about the technology. My people are some of the most anti-fragile and resilient people I know, and I'm sure we'll get out of it as long as we have the right systems, government, private sector, together at the bottom to support the entrepreneur and the farmer. That's the holy trilogy and that's amazing. It's just about when will these systems finally be available? And I suppose that's a frustration across the board for almost everything. Okay, we have yeah. another question from Lowell Mohammed. So I'll unmute you now, Lowell, and you can just give a brief introduction. Um, keep the questions short and sweet so we can fit as many questions in uh, to this section as possible. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, thank you, Fatima. Uh, mine is not only a, a question, but um, a bit of a comment. And uh, I, I think we keep, we keep skipping that part about, because I was just typing now, uh, about that part, we have technology in agriculture, um, perhaps because Nasiru is a creative technologist, a tech uh, person, we tend to focus on that aspect of what is technology in agriculture. But um, if you take, for instance, pesticides, a uh, form of technology in agriculture, even precision farming that he keeps mentioning, that has nothing to do with bringing in any new form of input into farming mm -hmm. is also some form of technology. The spacing alone between how between um, you know stems where you plant or how you plant, or for instance, your seed. Yeah. 
sorry uh, lower ba margin ka yanzu amma i think i went mute Perfect. yeah okay you're back now okay thank you so i i, I was saying uh, we really took that for granted that technology simply refers to tech coming from ICT to agri like putting the soft parts to the brick and mortar but as 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 small as seed spacing is if you understand seed spacing in agriculture it, it's a technology it's a technology people are doing a high density uh, you know planting these days we can double yield like nasser um, you know rightly mentioned um, the other time um omar she who talked about um you know smallholder farmers i i think it's quite interesting that the issue of smallholder farmers is uh, coming up because i know nasser himself has dealt with that in the field extensively extensively uh now my question will be to nasser uh this is uh not in personal and it will not be private so you will have to address it before um all of us the question is where do we start you know all of these things you said can really be brought together uh the stakeholders the government the investors where do we really start where 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 do we sow the first seed that actually you know germinates and grows mm -hmm. and becomes uh you know what we really want to see with agriculture uh in anywhere because why i'm asking this question is um you and i know a lot of policy interventions in agri has failed woefully we cannot even go about mentioning you know particular um uh, interventions small uh, uh what do you call it mm -hmm. a lot has failed so where do we really start for us to be able to get it right now so got okay uh thanks so much for that um uh, i think everything you've said is crucial and uh, uh they say uh, the answer is in the uh i mean most of the things you said i think were self explanatory in in terms of providing the answers that you you see first of all um productivity is a function of the environment right no matter how much uh productivity or production you want to do you need to have the land you need to have the you know uh, availability of resource to do that right and uh, a lot of the farmers that we are dealing with currently uh small holders 1 hectare maybe less in some cases you'd be shocked most of the small holders are even a hectare or less and these people we can group them in one specific uh sort of demography right trust me if you look at agricultural data of 10000 farmers you begin to see trends actually uh let me see if i can quickly share my screen um uh, moderator i know we are 3 minutes to we are it's cutting close okay okay no need i i i would do that another day sure. i would have shown you how we've been able to kind of uh continuously predict these kind of things in terms of what group the farmer falls in the level of education the reception mm -hmm. what they can do what they can receive what they can produce you know the yield and all of this and i think that's the place we need to begin we need to be able to know you can't go to a location that you don't know uh, uh, the address of so if you don't know the farmer you're dealing with you're defeated in the very beginning so we all buy mpk for farmers that probably need no nitrogen or potassium on their farm which means we're just degrading their soil right so first of all i need we need i think we need to do that scoping whether you're from the government or the investor or the entrepreneurial side we need to know the farmer we need to be able to have accurate agricultural data in nigeria in the very beginning so if you any of you here become president the first thing you should do is check the integrity of the agricultural data and i know that we cannot wait we can't say we're going to wait and stop all production until we get the data right no but you know any effort towards that would actually be your starting point so we have links we have um uh i think there are like a dozen 
agricultural or you know uh well being and uh what what's it called you know anti poverty schemes and programs and institution from all over the world most of them start with that you know evaluation that data because they understand how important it is right all of them except our agricultural ministry all of them except our federal right. government and state right. government what so that's where we need to start boss right so hopefully we'll reach a point where we can start innovating in these fields and actually processing the data and pulling useful information from this I'm talking quickly because we are approaching our closing time. I suppose we have till um, 20 past to do this. So I know there's a, a few more questions. We have five hands up um, for now. Um, if you can just drop your questions in the chat and we can forward it to you, um, Nasser. Um, okay, so I'm reading the chat. Do you want me to, or will absolutely. you just, yeah, if you have together. Time, I'll pull together um, the list of questions and we can ask them further of you. Okay, fantastic. Oh, uh, Nasser just said he added 10 minutes. So if you, I know you were going back and forth, um, but <laughs> um, I know there was two people in particular, Salim and this person with the Huawei Nova phone who have been really trying to get the question across. So two, if we could just answer these two questions and then we can just wrap this whole thing up. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, which one? So uh, Salim U Usman. Okay. We'll start with you and then we have the person with the Huawei Nova phone. They've been patiently waiting. Yes, good good evening everyone. My name is Salim. I first and foremost uh, thank I first and foremost thank the first and foremost thank the presenter uh, for this uh, marvelous presentation. And that was indeed inspiring. And uh, my question is uh, Babangona Outgrow Program um, has been a quasi successful program in Kaduna, for example. So, as uh, an expert in technology, how do you think um, technology could galvanize the um, successfulness of the program in the near future? For example, maybe um, how do you think could that be possible? Maybe um, improvement of um, 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 technology maybe seed varieties, among many other things that could galvanize um, the successfulness of the program in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Yeah. Thank you, Salim. Uh, I think this is important. So I did speak about Bobongona in the beginning of this uh, pro of the talk, and uh, it, what they're doing is good, but not the best, you know. Um, they have their challenges like every entrepreneur in Nigeria. However, uh, like I've spoken to, I think it's Mohammed Law, um, and actually we've exemplified one of the first things we did uh, after working in agriculture for the past four years in Nigeria, I realized that we really need to do the heavy lifting for the farmer. So for instance, you can get all the money in the world from venture capitalists in Washington and bring your millions of dollars in Nigeria, and uh, you say you're going to work with smallholder farmers in northern Nigeria and you galvanize them, you bring them together, you give them the input, you find the market for them. If the input or the output that that market wants is not exact, it's not going to work out. And I think that's what's happening with Babangona. So they have... Uh, you know, an amazing story in terms of output, in terms of the farmers they have, but it's business as usual when it comes to input. It's the same maize that the farmers are producing, using the same chemicals, using the same, well, sometimes different techniques because they have extension. However, what we've done is we've invested in a seed company. So we're going to have a certified uh, seed, quality seed that is, you know, if you like, engineered for the farmers that we are talking about and for the for the market that we are talking about. And you'd be shocked. There are a lot of entrepreneurs or enterprises that can do this with one eye closed in terms of their resources and, you know, what it takes to set up a seed company. But they're not doing that because they think that innovation or technology is all about apps and computers. So I think uh, uh, Bangunia and many of these companies need to think twice in terms of uh, the planting so the, or the the input 
So if you can't invest yourself, this is why partnership and collaborations are important. Get a good seed company that is willing to innovate on your terms for the farmer so that the farmer can produce better for a market that's ready and wants their productivity. That's really great. And definitely hammering in that message of partnership and collaboration in pushing this country forward and in everyone working together to, to bring something amazing. So I'll open the floor for this person with the Huawei phone, and this will be our last question for this session. Do ask a lot more questions in the comment box, and we'll definitely um, forward them on to you and get them um, answered. Okay, the floor is yours, uh, the person with the Huawei Nova phone. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, I hope you can hear me. Yes, give a brief introduction. Yeah, yeah. My, my, uh, yeah my name is uh, Abu Bakr Bala. Sorry I didn't get my name on the meeting uh, platform because I was sleeping actually. And I woke up to attend this meeting because I saw the title and it's interesting because it's around 5 a.m. here in Malaysia. I'm a PhD student in uh, University of Technology Petronas here in Malaysia. I'm studying electrical engineering. I'll make it very fast since we're rounding up. Thank you very much, the presenters and also the questioners. I think two two questions. First, his opinion on crowdfunding agriculture. Instead of always getting funds from this uh, this uh, bodies, international bodies in millions of dollars, can we as individual crowd uh, crowd uh, crowdfund agriculture? Secondly, as an expert of uh, a stakeholder in this agriculture thing. What is your issue on this farmer head uh, crisis? Uh, I have farmed in Nigeria. I farmed uh, in Kano, very close in the UK new site in Gozo. I farmed inside the campus of new site. And after my harvest, this cattle full, I need people to leave their cattle to come and eat my crops. If I uh, very close in Gozo, I cannot farm. Talk about going far to Dekasoye or whatever part of the, of the state to farm. So what is the solution to this farmer head has a serious issue. And maybe thirdly, actually, sorry, the third question is, all these ideas I, I see you people discussing, very interesting ideas, but I don't see them locally. I go to the village, I don't see the, the machineries, I don't see the tractors. I think you, you guys are working at the top. You are not at the bottom. Uh, thank you very much once again uh, for the presentation. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much for your questions. And uh, I mean, I agree with you. I feel your pain. <laughs> First of all, regarding crowdfunding. Um, so I know at least five crowdfunding uh, platforms in Nigeria. One of their CEOs is here. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, I believe it's crucial. Farmers need finance. However, um, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it starts there. I don't think that's the first step in solving the uh, farmer's problem. It's not the greatest pain point. Are you with me? Yeah, I think so. Yes, I am. Okay. Um, it, it's not the greatest pain point. Um, and what the farm, what the crowdfunding uh, platforms should do first is start from that market angle. Any of them that's able to walk around agricultural financing from the market perspective is going to be phenomenally successful. None of them so far employs that approach in terms of say, I have found farmers uh, or a market, let's say, let's use ShopRite. ShopRite needs one metric ton of, let's say, sweet corn. And you get a thousand farmers in Kanu to grow that specific sweet corn. And then you get a thousand investors from other locations to crowdfund for them to grow that sweet corn so that ShopRite could buy. Nobody does that currently. All they do is, we have a farm, a maize farm, we have a poultry farm, we have, you should sponsor it. That's all. It's not going to work. But once you have that market-driven approach, you're able to, you know, work on the input, work on the output, work on the farmers, the extension, and you have a complete value chain. But most of them don't. Um, secondly, you talked about uh, farmer herder crisis. Nowhere in the world produces, uh, you know, cattle or dairy or any of the things in that value chain the way we do. That idea of, you know, herding and going from place to place looking for pasture and water mm -hmm. is outdated. It's left for the hunter-gatherer, really. Nobody does that. 
I was in Rio de Janeiro in 2017 and I met Embrapa. I think everybody should read this article, uh, The Miracle on the Cerrado. It was about how Brazil turned around their agricultural sector to become one of the major exporters of agricultural produce in the world mm -hmm. uh, by simply investing in Embrapa. Embrapa is like the government angle that oversees agricultural Perfect. technology and innovation. And it's amazing. Um, no. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll end it there. They have employed a massive system of uh, agricultural productivity when it comes to cattle, and mm -hmm. it doesn't involve herd in the way we do it. So, yeah. Thank you very much for your amazing talk and also for answering all these questions. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I appreciate you all have pressing questions. We will collect them all and um, forward that your list of the book um, and also you know any papers that you have. And um, we'll email you and keep in touch and we'll pass on the questions. Thank you everyone for your time. I appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much. Nasser Dean, thank you. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.